خبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم والحمد لله رب العالمین و صلات و سلام علی سیدنا محمد اللهم صل على سيدنا خير بحاني خير زايد بسم الله وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين الذي يملأ الأرض قسطا وعدلا كما ملأت ظلما وجورا ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومخالفيهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك أبيوان الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك علي وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا صلوات For the health and the reappearance of Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjallah Farajjahu Sharif Let's have another loud salawat Allah Amir Hussain Louder please In the past few nights we've been talking about The dua One of the duas in Ziyarat Ashura I hope everyone can hear me all the way in the back Insha'Allah The ladies in the back can you hear me Insha'Allah um, If the sound is okay please let me know because It seems like we have sound problem tonight Insha'Allah We can fix it Let's have a loud salawat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajit wa We've been talking about the dua in Ziyar al-Ashura, Allahumma ja'al mahya ya mahya Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad wa mamati mamata Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad Ya Allah, please bless us to have a spiritual life Bless us to have to live on the principles in which Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam lived and die on the principles that Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam died We've been talking about a spiritual life, life for the past few nights and and I know one of the questions that might come to your mind is that Shaykh, you know, this is spiritual life that you're expecting us to have is for back home it's not for America you're living in a different world back home in Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq go there and practice your spiritual life but in this country, it is very difficult for people to practice that. You know, this is an industrial country. People go to work. It's dominated by Christians and non-Muslims. You know, it's very difficult for us to have a spiritual life that you're expecting. You expect a lot. How do you expect us to have that life in this country? Now to answer this question, I would like to mention an ayah from Quran. In this ayah, Allah Taala narrates a conversation between angels who take life and those who are wrongdoers. Allah Taala says in Quran, "Inna al-ladina tawafahum al-malaik al-zalimi anfusihim, qalu fi ma kuntum, qalu kunna mustadafina fil-ard." In this conversation, 
It happens when the angels come to take your life, to take the life of someone who has wronged himself, who has committed a lot of sins, who had not practiced spiritual life when he was alive. So when the angels come to take his life, they'll tell him, Fi makuntum. Basically, where have you been? What state have you been? What happened to you? Why didn't you, you know, reach, reach your goal to be spiritual, to have a spiritual life? The answer that they give to the angels, Allah is narrating this conversation. Allah says, the angels, the, these people, reply to the question of the angels by saying, Kunna mustada'afina fil ard. Do you know why we did not practice Islam? They bring an excuse. What is their excuse? They said, do you know why we did not have a spiritual life in this world? Kunna mustada'afina fil ard. Mustada'afin. We can say that it means that we were minority. We were weak. We were poor. We did not have power. We, we lived in areas where it was dominated by non-Muslims, for example. <coughs> we were mustad'af. We are, we are not powerful. We are weak. So because of that, we did not practice Islam. We did not follow the rules of Allah Taala. And how familiar is this excuse, right? How many times have you heard this from Muslims in the West? Brother, why, why not praying? Come on, this is America. Life is different here. Allahu Akbar, the same excuse that is brought by the Muslims here in the West, in the 21st century, is mentioned in the Quran. Kunna mustadhafina fil ar. Come on, we couldn't do it. Brother, why don't you pray? Well, you know, when I go to work, all the co-workers are non-Muslim. I'm embarrassed to pray at noon. I feel ashamed to pray in front of non-Muslims. And my classmates, for example, when I'm in college or in class. Brother, you know, why did you go to that party? Did that, for example, birthday party? I said, come on. I mean, I was invited by my friends and I couldn't tell them that, you know, dancing and listening to music is haram in Islam. How can I explain this to them? <laughs> if, my, if I had said to my Christian friends that, you know, we don't listen to music, we don't dance, what would they think about me? They would think that, you know, I'm a very fanatic person, I'm barbaric, and they would not be friends with me anymore. You expect me not to go there because, you know, music is haram and this and that? I can't make friends like that, right? Or for example, when you tell a lady, please lady, observe your hijab. Come on, this is America. I will feel ashamed. I will feel embarrassed at work, at, when I go to school. Or someone says, come on, how can, I, how can I explain to my co-worker that I cannot shake her hand? Right? She comes forward as a sign of respect. She wants to shake my hand. If I say no, like what does what is, what is it going? What is she going to think about me? I'm a respectful person. So basically, practicing Islam puts us on the spot. Practicing Islam in this country uh, is tough and it makes us embarrassed and ashamed and being mocked and ridiculed, especially when we talk about peer pressure. Especially when we think, when we think about the youth who are going to, for example, middle school, high school, they want to be cool, they want to be with their friends, and they see their friends doing some stuff which is haram in our religion, they want to be with them, they want to you know, hang out with them. So exactly the same excuses that are brought up, unfortunately, in this 21st century in America by us, a lot of us, is mentioned in the Quran. Angels tell them, why didn't you practice? Why didn't you have a spiritual life? Why did you transgress the boundaries of Allah? They say, well, sorry. We were minority, we were weak. Now, what do the angels say in reply? This is a conversation between the angels and those who are about to 
you know, who, who their life is about to be taken by the angels. And they have wronged themselves. The angels tell them, listen to this carefully, tells them, tell them, Alam takun arudullahi wa sa'atan fatuhajiru fiha fa'ulaika ma'awahum jahannam wa sa'at nasira. The angels would say to them, wasn't the land of Allah vast, expanded, broad? You couldn't practice your religion. Let's imagine that it is correct. You, you couldn't practice it in this city, in this country. You could have gone to somewhere else. Now, let us analyze this ayah because it's a very beautiful ayah. There is an argument going on between two sides. One is one side we have the angels on the other side we have humans who have wronged themselves and have not practiced spiritual life now this argument this both-sided argument in the saying we, we want to analyze this because I, I i think there are very important points that we can learn from this ayah what the people say what the sinful people say to the angels was what kunna mustadafina fil in this, there is a claim, and by that claim, they are making an excuse. They are claiming that being a minority would cause you to lose faith. Right? This is a claim that they are making. Allah does not come to refute their claim. Allah does not argue with them. I mean, Allah, I mean the angels. The angels would not, do not argue with them about their claim, whether their claim is correct or not. What the angels tell them is that for the sake of argument, this is called jadal. This type of argument is called jadal. The angels basically tell them, for the sake of argument, let's accept that being mustadaf or minority would cause you to lose faith. Let's accept this statement okay, for a second. But that's can, that cannot be used as an excuse. That cannot be used as an excuse. You could have gone to somewhere else. Now, first we want to talk about their claim because it's a very important claim that they're making. Is their claim correct? Is it right? What was their claim? We were weak in the place, that, in the environment that we're living. We were a minority, right? and a base and that's why we didn't practice is this claim correct or not this is what we want we want to talk about now when we look at the life of the holy prophets all the prophets 124,000 prophets from prophet adam until prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam let's have a loud salawat for his name We see that every single one of them were my, was minority. And they were weak, and they were ridiculed, at least in the beginning of their mission. Look at Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when he was in Mecca. At first, only three, only, there were only three Muslims. Prophet himself, Khadija sallallahu and Amir al -Mu'min. Minority. In the city of Mecca, where thousands of people are living. Until the end of the life of Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi in the city of Mecca, right from the time that he started his mission as a prophet, he was 40 years old. Until he was 53 years old, he stayed in Mecca for 13 years, right? 13 years from the time that he started his mission until he left Mecca to Medina. You know how many people became Muslim? Only 200 people. Only 200. After 13 years, at most, what historians have mentioned, are 200 people. They're a minority. So being a minority should not cause us to panic and to lose faith. You see, in the story of Prophet Nuh, he was a minority. Not for one or two years. For 950 years, he was mustad'af al -ab. He was weak, he didn't have power, he was a minority, he was oppressed by the powerful people for 950 years that he had, that he was prophet for. 
The rich people used to come to him and say, قَالُوا أَنُؤْمِنُ لَكَ وَاتَّبَعَكَ الْأَرْذَلُونَ The rich people used to come to Prophet Nuh and tell him, do you want us to believe in you and accept your religion while those who accepted you and while those who have accepted your religion are, you know, weak people, poor people, riffraff. Of course we're not going to accept you. We're rich. You are just a small minority with a belief that you have and you guys are poor. Why should we follow you? You look at all the prophets, they were minorities. They were mustad'af al arb but never, they never gave up. And it's beautiful how Allah Taala complains humans and all the servants who lived at the time of all prophets by saying, Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَحْزِئُونَ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَحْزِئُونَ This is a very, I think, important complaint that Allah is making in Quran. He's complaining us. يَا حَسَّةً عَلَى الْعِبَادِ How regrettable, how sorrowful of the servants, عباد. For every time a messenger went to them, they ridiculed him. Every single. مَا يَأْتِيهَمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ أَنَّكَرَ فِي سِيَاغَ النَّارِ يُفِيدُ الْأُمُومِ Every single one of the prophets were, was ridiculed, was made fun of, where it was mocked. The people laughed at him. And, you know, when you bring this excuse that, you know, you know in America, if I want to practice Islam, at work, at the school, here and there, you know, I, people laugh at me, people look at me weird, and all the prophets, you're not alone. All the prophets experience this thing. You're not alone. All the prophets experience this. Brother, when you want to pray, when you want to say no to haram to your friend, if your friend is inviting you to do something haram, whether it's going to a haram party or club or something that's haram, Right? Or when it comes to doing something wajib, don't feel em embarrassed. You should not be the one who feels embarrassed. Those who are not practicing should feel embarrassed. You should be proud. Because we believe that the commands of Allah and the prohibitions that Allah has brought to us are not only for Muslims. This is something that we Muslims believe that the you know, wajibat and muharramat or for every single person who is living on this planet. Those who have not accepted Islam will be punished for two reasons. Number one, for not accepting Islam. And number two, for not praying. And number, I mean, for not, you know, fasting, for drinking alcohol, for doing zina and this and, and that. So, they also have the wajibat and muharramat. Wajibat and muharramat are not only for the Muslims. Your Christian friend who is not praying, who is not fasting, he should be embarrassed. Not you. You should be proud that you are following the rule of your Lord. So proudly stand and say, this is the time of pray. I need to go and pray. Whether you are at work or you are at school, doesn't matter where you are. Proudly go pray. Anyone comes to you and you know, makes fun of you or tells you something, explain to him. Don't, you know, feel embarrassed. In another ayah, Allah Taala says, "Kadalika ma taladhiya min qablihim min rasulin illa qalu sahirun aw majnun." Every single prophet, every single prophet who came was called by the people of his time sahir aw majnun. People told him, "You are either a magician or majnun, crazy." You guys are crazy. Why are you doing this? Why do you get together, beat your chest? What is this? Come on. A lot of people don't come to Majalis. They say, come on. What would you know, the Christians tell, say and think about our practices, our spiritual rituals? You tell them, come on, for example, there is a Azadari march, morning march 
in Washington, in New York, let's go outside, let's mourn, let's do this in front of people, they can see, they can learn about Imam Hussein. They would say, come on, what would they think about us when they, when they see us beating our chest? This doesn't look good. Don't feel embarrassed to practice your religion. All the prophets. There is a beautiful saying from Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi, let's have a loud salawat for his name. The hadith, this hadith, I heard this, I don't, I don't remember which shaykh told me this hadith when I was very young, maybe like 15 or 16 years old. But this is one of the hadith that really changed my life. And I hope that tonight you can take this hadith home and ponder upon this hadith and changes your life as well. It's a life-changing hadith for us who are living in the West. Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullah wa salamu alayhi Say, لا تستوحشوا يا معشر الناس لا تستوحشوا في طريق الهدى لقلة أهله What a beautiful saying. يا علي أمير الكلام He said, do not be frightened if you are stepping on the right path if you are on the right path if you are with حق if you are with the truth if you are on the right path of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam fi tariq al huda do not be frightened if you only see one or two people few people following the haq if the whole world becomes an becomes what atheist the whole world says that we do not want to accept Islam Allah Imam Mahdi or anything but you know that you are on the right path by following Amir al Mu'minin salawatullah wa salam Imam says, La tastawahishu. Do not be frightened. Because loneliness usually brings what? Fear. Imam says, Don't fear if you are lonely on the, right, on the path of Allah. Just because you are a minority doesn't mean that you are bad. No. In many verses, Allah Ta'ala disgraces and talks negative about the majority. أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ أَكْثَرُهُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ أَكْثَرُهُمُ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Most of them are mushrik, most of them do not appreciate, most of them are kafir, most of them are... The... Just because, you know, the majority are living in a different way doesn't mean that our way of life is wrong. لا تستوحشو. And when I heard this hadith, I was, uh, as I said, maybe 15, 16 years old, I had just come to the U.S. and I felt like, you know, Amir al-Mu'min salawatullah alayhi had, has come and standing in, in, in front of me and is telling me this hadith because it addressed my situation. And I know that this is the situation for most of our youth who are going to school, who are working, and who are living in this society. When they see themselves the only one praying at work, they feel weird, right? Like, am I doing the right thing? Like... <laughs> لا تستوحشوا. If you are with Ali, if you are with Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, if you have Hayat al Tayyibah, Hayat Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, do not fear. Not only you should not fear, not only being a minority does not, should not, you know, make you leave the religion and not have a spiritual life, but it should also make you invite others to Islam. Do da'wah. There is a person at the time of Imam al-Sadiq his name is Hamad al-Samandari. He says, Hamad says that one day I came to Imam al-Sadiq I told him, I asked Imam, Ya Imam, I go to Bilad al-Shirk, the countries, the non-Muslim countries back then. Maybe Rome or, you know, those places that Muslims used to go. I go to Bilad al-Shirk in the countries that are majority non-Muslim. And you know what people tell me? The people tell me that, you know, when I go to those places, if I die, I would be resurrected as one of them. I would be counted as one of those mushrikeen. They tell me, you're going to, for example, blood of shirk, you're going to America, you know, when you die, you'll die as one of those mushriks and Christians and atheists. 
He will not be one of us. <laughs> uh, I think some of you have heard this from people back home. They tell you, if you're really religious, why didn't you go to America? <laughs> Same thing. He said, you know, Hamad said that people tell me when you go to non-Muslim country, you will be one of them. Imam asked him a question. He said, Hamad, if I contest, have Quran amrana what had o elaina? When you go to those non Muslim countries, do you remember our wilayat? Do you invite people to the religion of Ahlul Bay? Do you do this? He says, Yes. He said, Yes, I do that. Imam told him, asked him, When you come back to Islamic countries, do you invite people to Islam? Do you you know, have majalis, for example. He said, no. And that's how usually people are. A lot of people are like this. When there are non-Muslim countries, they are more religious. A lot of people are like this because they see most people not religious. They want to keep their religion, so they do more religious, you know, uh, activities. So he says that, no, when I go actually to Blad al-Shirk, to non-Muslim countries, I invite people to Islam, to Ahlul Bayh, -Salam. I do this. Do you know what Imam told him? Imam -Salam told him, in Naka. In mitta thamma, in mitta thamma, hushirta ummata wahdak, wasa'a nuruka bayna yadayk. You who go to non-Muslim countries and do not lose faith, and instead you invite people to the religion of Ahlul Bayh alayhi wasalam, not only you are a good Muslim, but when you die, and on the day of judgment, you will be resurrected as a nation yourself. Ummatan wahdak. And wasa'a nuruka and your light would glow in front of you on the day of judgment. This is how you will be resurrected. So being a minority doesn't mean living the religion, but instead it should give you more motivation to bring people toward Islam. Ahlul Bay alayhi salam. I remember I met a Shaykh in Qom. He didn't look Iranian, so I asked him, Where are you from? He said, I'm from Thailand. Well, I was kind of surprised to see a sheikh from Thailand. I didn't expect that. So I asked him about his story. I said, you know, are you a convert? You know, did you become Muslim, Shia recently? He said, no. We've been, our, my family has been Shia for 500 years. <laughs> I said, how come? He said, 500 years, there was a man from Qom, Sheikh Ahmed Al-Qummi. Who went to Thailand for business? He was Sheikh and also he went there for business. He has a long story, Sheikh Ahmed Al Qomi. If you research his name, you see that he still has a grave and people go and inspect his grave in, in Thailand. Sheikh Ahmed Al Qomi came to Thailand. He made relation with the government. Slowly, slowly, he stayed there and he opened a masjid, Shia masjid in Thailand. This is 500 years ago. And Several people became Shia at first, then the Shias grew, and now we have thousands of, thou uh, thousands of Shias in Thailand. After 500 years. By one person who migrated from Qom to Thailand. Can you be the next Sheikh Ahmed Al Qomi of America? Yes. Your grand, 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 grandchildren after 500 years, right? They tell people, you know. My father migrated from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Iran, right? And now we have millions of Muslims in America. It's all because of him, for example, those people who migrated. You can be the next Sheikh Ahmed Al Qummi for, the, for this country. So do not lose faith, do not back up, do not give up. If you are a minority, rather, you should practice Islam more. And so this is the claim. The claim is not correct. The claim that they were making was that being a minority causes us to lose faith. This, the claim, of course, is not correct, is rejected. But what, how did the angels respond to them? They said, Even if you believe, even if you believe that that's the case, and you have to leave religion because of being a minority, if you still believe that, if what I said until now, didn't, you know, make sense to you? Do you know what you have to do? 
Isn't the land of Allah vast? Go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. Migrate. Islamically, it becomes wajib. Wajib, shar'an wajib for you. To migrate to another land. If you think that you would lose faith by staying in this country. It's wajib for you to migrate to another land. One of the great sins, the deadly sins in Islam is At-Ta'arrubu Ba'da Al-Hijrah At-Ta'arrubu Imam Sarr alayhi salam said At-Ta'arrubu Ba'da Al-Hijrah is one of the great sins What is At-Ta'arrubu Ba'da Al-Hijrah? At-Ta'arrubu Ba'da Al-Hijrah is when a person leaves his Islamic country, goes to another country, migrates to a non-Muslim country and because of being in a non-Muslim country, he loses faith he does not practice Islam. This is one of the great sins. And in that case becomes mandatory, wajib, for you to migrate. Have you heard of a wajib migration? This is a wajib migration. A mandatory migration. I don't think that you, you know, <coughs> are forced to do that and you can still practice your religion here. But even, Quran says, even if you believe that, you have an option. You cannot bring this as an excuse. You have to migrate to another place and do not stay here. A lot of Muslims I know they move back for example to Iran, to Afghanistan to so that they can raise their children better there. If you have to then you go ahead. Don't stay here. I can't raise my children here. Good. Go to another city. Go to LA. Go to New York. <laughs> go to Houston. Go anywhere that you can. Go to another country. Go back to your own country, wherever it's possible for you to raise your children and, your, and keep yourself on the right path of Ahlul Bayt And immigration becomes a, a wajib for you. So do not bring this excuse that, you know, I, I'm here, I can't lose, you know, keep my faith. If you say so, if you really believe in this claim, it's wajib for you tonight to go home, pack up everything, and find somewhere else to live. Allah does not, has not left an excuse for us to leave the religion. Allah says in Quran, وَمَنْ يُهَاجَرْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ يَجَدْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَةً Allah says in Quran, anyone who migrates for the path, in the path of Allah, for the sake of Allah, Taala, he will find refuge and abundance. Allah encourages people to migrate. For the sake of Allah Taala. So if you have to, go ahead. We don't have a lot of time to discuss this. Inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow. But our beloved Imam, Imam Al Hussein Alayhi Salam, also immigrated. He immigrated from Medina to Mecca, and from Mecca to Kufa. Fi sabilillah. He knew that this immigration will cause him to die and be killed but he, make, he immigrated fi sabilillah for the path of Allah wa ta'ala he did not give up and in the land of Karbala he was a minority he was a minority right thousands of people were in front of him only few people were standing by his side he was a minority but never gave up the story of Karbala should give you this lesson, brothers and sisters, and that being a minority in America should not cause you to lose faith because our Imam Hussein was a minority in Karbala, was, didn't have a lot of power, but he stood there, he stood by the, by the haqq until the last drop of his blood. So this is the, inshallah, lesson that we need to learn from the story of Karbala and he also sacrificed his son Ali Al-Akbar that we will do tawassul tonight inshallah Sallallahu alayka ya mazloom ya aba abdillah Assalamu alayka ya aba Allah, وعلى الأرواح 
حلتي حلت بفناي عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم Everyone together السلام على الحسن علي ابن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى Tonight we are remembering the son of Imam Al-Hussein Ali Al-Akbar on the day of Ashura, when all the companions were martyred, Ali al Akbar came to Imam Hussein to take permission. He was the first one from Bani Hashim. He came to Imam Hussein and said, Ya Abba, la maqan Allah ba'daka tarfatain. Oh my father, I would not like to live even a second after you. Can you imagine a young son has come to his old father for permission to die? How hard it must be for a father to allow his son to go to the battlefield. أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنتقا برسول الله علي أكبر looked exactly like the prophet when people wanted to remember the holy prophet they would come and look at the blessed face of Ali Al-Akbar when the children and ladies in the tent learn that Ali Akbar is about to go to the battlefield فَإِذَا ضَجَّةً قَامَتْ مِنَ الْحَرَامِ وَعَجَّةٌ عَلَتْ مِنَ الْفُسْتَادِ Children and ladies came out from the tent crying saying farewell to Ali Akbar Ali Akbar mounted his horse and went to the battlefield. He reached the battlefield. When he reached the battlefield, the people could not believe their eyes. They thought that the Prophet of Islam has returned. Ali Akbar fought bravely while he was reciting Ana Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali Nahnu wa baytu Allah awla bin Nabi He killed many of the enemies Ali Akbar got tired He was very thirsty He had not drank water for three days He came back to his father Imam Hussain And said Ya Abel Atashu Qad qatalani Oh, my father, thirst is killing me. Imam Hussein told him, Esper qalilan, Atta yuzqinka Rasulullah. Be patient, my son, soon. The Holy Prophet will give you water. 
him. Ali Akbar knew that his father Hussein doesn't have any water. Why did he return to the Khayma? Why did he return to the tent and complain to Imam Hussein that he was thirsty? Some historians have said Ali Akbar knew, but he made Atash and thirst as an excuse to come back to the tent and see his father for the last time. Ali Akbar returned to the battlefield. Omar Sa'ad Malun ordered his soldiers to kill Ali Al Akbar. While a few soldiers together attacked and together attacked Ali Akbar, one crept up to him and thrust his spear into Ali Akbar's chest. The spear penetrated Akbar's chest. The handle broke. A sharp blade stuck into Akbar's heart that caused him to faint. Ali Akbar fell off from his horse. Ya Sahib al Zaman, Fahdawah al Qam, Fahdawah al Qam, Irban, Irban. <laughs> when he fell from his horse, the enemy surrounded Akbar and cut him into pieces. <laughs> Ya sahib al zaman Imam Hussein rushed to the battlefield Imam Hussein saw his son cut into pieces <laughs> Ali Akbar was taking his last breath wa waza akhadahu ala Imam Hussein placed his cheek on the cheek of Ali Al Akbar and cried very hard. Lady Zainab was looking at this position from the tent. She said to herself that my brother is about to pass out and die. She ran towards his brother. brother. She ran towards her brother to help Imam Hussein. But when she came and saw Ali Al Akbar in that situation, she even cried harder. <laughs> Imam Hussein said, Akbar, my, dear, my darling Akbar, how should I take you back to the sand? I, I raise your leg, your hands are on the ground. <laughs> اکبر هم چطور تو را به خیمه برگردونم بابا دست تو بلند میکنم پا تو زمینه پا بر زمین نکش جگرم تیر میکشم بزر بازش کنیم امشب دیگه شب آقا علی اکبره دیده کسی که داره جون میده هنوز نفس داشت آقا علی اکبر وقتی امام حسین رسید وقتی داره کسی جون میده دیده چیزا پاچه به زمین میکنه پا بر زمین نکش جگرم تیر میکشم <تصفيق> ای نور دیده پلک ترم تیر می کشد اکبرم گفتم اصای پیری من می شوی نشد یاری رسان مرا کمرم تیر می کشد بیت آخر رو داتون کنم ای پاره تنم ای پاره تنم پاره تن ای پاره تنم چقدر پاره پاره ای <تصفيق> 
خوش به حال هر کس که اینا رو نفهمید ای پاره تنم چقدر پاره پاره ای با دیدنت علی جگرم تیر بیکشد رحم الله من نادا و حسینا